sit in my pajamas, go on to 10 crowdfunding websites, download 10 or 20 apartment deals, literally lay them out all next to each other and look at the similarities and the differences. And once you start to see the differences, you start to learn what to look for. Tate, I think that was one of the best episodes we've had on turning active income into passive income and a step-by-step plan for how to get there. What are your, what are your thoughts? I completely agree, man. Um, Jeremy is just a legend. He is massive in the real estate world. And I think our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. And I, and I mean it in the kindest way possible, but he's probably as boring as it gets too, which is great. <laughs> boring is good. <laughs> I think what Ryan means is he's conservative, right? He is not yes. a big risk taker. He's not out there, um, you know, taking wild swings and seeing what works. He's very calculated and concerned and uh, rightly so. He, he takes a very, very uh, serious approach to investing and a conservative approach to investing. He's probably one of the most he is the most, I think, conservative passive investor that I've ever met. Um, but he's done very well and he's left the corporate world. Yeah. And I think what's amazing is he has taken all of his active income that he used to earn from a full time job. He worked at Disney, then he went to Toyota. He left the corporate world entirely and then converted his income 100% and more into passive income. I think at, at a ratio of uh, over three to one. So, this episode really what what kind of sparked our interest in bringing on Jeremy was you know there's pilots out there who don't want to work as much or they want they want to have more discretionary income that they don't have to trade their time for or maybe they want to be active in real estate investing but they don't want to do all the work and Jeremy is a great example of that with that wanted to get into some things that we talked about cuz Jeremy is a very technical guy he's had a lot of experience on that so before we dive into the episode Asset class. That was the a, a, a word thrown a lot, around a lot. And when you're in private uh, alternative investing, like if you're doing these syndications, you're putting in twenty five or fifty thousand, and you're giving it to an operator who's going out and buying a type of asset class. An asset class just means self storage or multifamily or office, retail, industrial. And so when he says that he's diversifying across different types of asset classes, what he has done has He's invested passively in a collection of different asset classes like office, retail, industrial, storage, RV park, mobile home parks. And of those asset classes, he's actually going to talk about what his favorite asset classes has been in over 150 deals that he's done. He's literally invested, he's done these 25, 50,000, maybe $100,000 deals over 150 times. So he's he's been in a lot of different deals. But I think the favorite thing that I have is you know, when you invest in these deals, you know, the, for the first time you're putting in 50 grand or whatever, and you might be only making, you know, 150 to $300 a month in passive income. He really gets into how you can snowball that and turn that into literally replacing an income like 30, 40, $50,000 yeah, a month right. of passive income and the, some of the tax benefits that go along with that as well. So. Excellent. And with that, let's jump in. Jeremy Roll, thank you so much for coming on the show. I got to start with this story. Five years ago, I was an active real estate investor, airline pilot and active real estate investor. I came to Denver. I saw you speak on stage. You were actually doing a debate with uh, Hunter Thompson. And I can't remember who was on the other side of the, the, the debate, but you're the person who introduced me to the idea of passive real estate investing. And I can't tell you how powerful that concept was to realize that, hey, I didn't have to be out there in some podunk town looking at rental properties, I could actually invest with with professional operators and get 80% of all the benefits that I was getting by doing it myself with my own bare hands. And you are the gold standard of that. You've done it. You've removed yourself from a corporate job um, and you've you've replaced your income with passive cash flow. So incredibly inspirational. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you, you've been on, on my previous shows before. I appreciate your time so much. So thank you again. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for having me here. Honestly, all I really care about is helpful for whoever is listening. So hopefully, thank you for watching and hopefully it'll be helpful. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. And and, and I'll say from my standpoint, what I love and I, I think what the the pilots will appreciate that are listening is I, we, we get into this mindset as pilots is that we can really only invest in public markets. We can only invest in Fidelity, Schwab, T. Rowe Price, trade stocks, bonds, mutual funds, traditional assets. And so we never learn what cash flow is. 
And so we always think it's this, you know, it's this race to retirement. How much money can I stuff in my 401k every year and hope there's enough to drip out when I'm, when I'm in my retirement years. And what we don't hear about is taking that active income that we're earning today, which pilots are making record salaries and, and, and pay, payrolls up at the airlines, which is great. Taking that active income and turning it into things that produce regular monthly cash flow that can start replacing or bolstering their current income and doing it in a way that makes it so like Tate said, you don't have to be a landlord. You don't have to be a um, uh, an active investor. And what I love about something you said, and sorry, we'll let you talk, we swear, but this, you know, what we admire so much is, um, you know, you introduced yourself one time as a full-time uh, or an active full-time passive real estate investor, I think is what you said. <laughs> and, and I love that because it's like, just because you're doing something passively, um, you can be a really good steward of what you're doing and making sure that you're not just throwing your money with anybody and the amount of due diligence you do on an operator and how educated you are in this private alternative space that produces this cash flow for our pilots, um, you are. So with that, um, you know, tell us your story and tell us, you know, kind of where you started and, and where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. And th guys, thanks again for having me on. And so I actually, so Ryan, I call myself a full-time passive cash flow investor. There we is, go. Because uh, I do mostly real estate, but not all real estate. But um, so, uh, so let me actually just take a few steps back because the truth is I didn't go through a process of trying to get out of the corporate world from the cash flow. I know a lot of people do, and I love watching that happen. I love talking to people who start and have, let's say a five-year, 10-year plan, whatever it is, and they actually get out. That's like my favorite to watch because it really, it changes your whole life like in many ways. Um, but I started in this type of investing back in 2002 after the dot-com crash for anyone out there who can remember that. And for me, it was really about how do I get my retirement funds away from the stock uh, stocks and bonds into more predictable um, type of returns for my long-term retirement. And so the challenge I had with watching a dot-com crash was really two things. One was the volatility. So in terms of it going, you know, I, I'm just not, I'm a really low risk guy. So watching the stock market go up and down 30% a year was not the right fit for me. But I think even more importantly, the lack of predictability of where my retirement account was going to be in 10, 20, 30 years because of that volatility. So I looked at different ways to invest, came across the concept of targeting cash flow, ended up landing on real estate. And I ended up targeting the lower risk spectrum of real estate there, you know, there's a thousand ways to invest in, in anything. Not, none of them are wrong. It's just a question of the right fit for the person. And so I was always targeting the low risk end of the spectrum focused on cash flow. And what I did was I rotated all my money from stocks and bonds into cash flow between 02 and 07. And then I actually, so just to give everybody history too. So at the time I was actually working at um, Disney headquarters in Burbank um, in Los Angeles. And I had a good middle level management job, really busy. And um, so I was in the corporate world, you know, which a lot of people can relate to. And then I switched to Toyota headquarters in 2006 here in Los Angeles as well. And another good job, middle level management. And um, I had a last strong moment with my manager in the corporate world in mid 2007. I had gotten promoted, switched divisions, and then was not well aligned with the new manager. And I ended up taking a risk, leaving the um, corporate world in mid 2007 from the cash flow. So again, my intention though was not to actually live off the cash flow. It wasn't like a master plan that I had, honestly. Um, it, but I ended up deciding to take the risk, leave the corporate world. So I've been a full-time passive cash flow investor since 07. So it's been almost 16 years now when we're recording this. Uh, but I've been uh, doing it um, since, well, actually for more than 21 years now, just in general. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, I have, um, I was on a typical corporate track. I have a Wharton MBA or from University of Pennsylvania. Um, and was working with some good Fortune 500 companies, worked for a couple startups, had over 10 years of corporate experience and um, ended up making that big pivot, which is a huge deal and very difficult to do, especially for someone who is really low risk like me. So it was really the cash flow that allowed for that. What, what that first investment you made, you know, because a lot of people might be listening, thinking I'm, I want to do that, but like what, what went into that first move and, or how would you do that move differently? this go around? Okay. Good questions. So just to give you the background on my first move. So my first investment and the funny thing is I, I always, I need to go back and research this properly. I know who it was with, I don't know if it was office retail or industrial because I did all three of those asset classes, but it was with the sponsor who actually was lifelong friends of my family in Montreal where I'm from. So I'm from Canada. I moved to the US in 1998 when I did my MBA. So I lived half my life there, half my, my life here now. 
And I've started with them for two reasons. One is because I knew I could trust them. I know them for like decades. And two is because I knew I'd be able to learn from them in a much more profound way than a typical investment with a typical sponsor. And so I dipped my toe, I think it was February of 02 in one of those asset classes with them, but it was in Canada. So I had currency risk, which is a whole different discussion, right? Because I was living in the US in US dollars, putting down into Canada. Um, and um, what I would say I would do differently today is two things, actually. One is I probably wouldn't be looking at a different country, even though I knew Canada really well, I had a lot of contacts or I knew the laws and everything else. That was a very unique situation, but putting that relationship with the sponsor side, there's no way I would be looking at a foreign investment as a first investment, that's for sure. The other thing I would say is that um, I got lucky with timing just to the, the extent that like the real estate cycle was a little bit in my favor at that time, but it's not like I researched it tremendously, right? It was like, a, it was my uh, response to the dot-com crash. But what I urge people now, like, cause I come across, I, you know, I speak to new people all the time, just trying to help them and brainstorm. And the first thing I say to them is, look, just because you now have the cash saved up to do this, or you decide you want to do it, it doesn't mean that the timing is right to do it. So you have to take into account your own cash position and your own desires, but you have to then study the, econ the economic cycle and the real estate cycle, both of them, so that by the time you make your first investment, you're making a very well-informed investment that you decide is the right timing and the right asset class for yourself. And I did not take those steps. I wasn't educated enough to actually take all those steps up front. So that's what I would definitely do for like. And, and how, if you don't mind sharing, how much was it? And then what happened? Did you get monthly or quarterly sure. cash flow? Yeah. And how, so yeah. I, I can't remember for sure. I'm going to guess it was 25,000. That was their minimum. At the time. Okay. 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 And it was actually in Canadian dollars. So at the time, call it 20,000 US. Sure. Or a little bit less. 18, and what ha what what happened? Did you start receiving 150 bucks a month or? Yeah, it was quarterly cash flow. Um, I was all about the cash flow. Um, I can't remember how much they delayed the cash flow because you know you have to have time to take over the property, sure. earn the income. But it was typically quarterly cash flow, typical quarterly reports. And um, I started to diversify more with them over the next couple of years. Um, and that's how I started to get down this path. And I actually started to diversify across a couple asset classes to learn them with them, which was really helpful. And I was just really lucky with that scenario. Now I'd like to ask one more question because I know Tate's dying to ask some things, but now, now, now that was, you know, sort of this experiment for lack of better words yeah. of, but, but you trusted the person. So yeah. that was kind of made it easy on you. And while it was a different country, you are from Canada. So there you were familiar, um, contrast that to today. What, 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 what would be your sort of you know, minimum viable due diligence that you would do on um, maybe one or two things, big, big ticket things that you've learned over the years, over the last 20 plus years of passive investing that you would do differently from, from that standpoint. You're saying from a first investment standpoint. Yeah. Or just, you know, what does Jeremy, what does Jeremy think about today? You know, if you, if you see a deal land on your desk, which I know you receive hundreds of opportunities yeah. on a regular basis, yeah. You know, what what catches your eye? What what processes would you take that investment through to give people perspective now of like, OK, that was his first time doing it. He sort of just sort of do dove in and experimented. But now, you know, with 20 years of experience, you know, what what's different today? Yeah. So there's a lot of differences. So the first <laughs> difference, like for sure, thank thankfully. Right. Because hopefully I've learned something over the past 20 <laughs> yeah. years. But uh, so first thing is I have preferred asset classes and asset classes I stay away from. And I do this from a um cycle timing perspective but also from a general like structural perspective meaning so like, easy example right if you invested in a retail strip center you know that had a massive circuit city in 2013 you'd have a problem right if they were an anchor tenant right and so it's those types of learnings i tend to because i have when i invest i tend to look at long term i actually typically look at a 10-year fixed rate loan that's been my scenario that's not changed and so I have to think way ahead because once I invest, I'm giving control to somebody else. And that's very important. That's the one challenge as an investor that you really have to consider carefully. And so I have to think ahead as to whether I agree with the business plan, both in terms of the numbers, but also the general strategic plan itself. Is this going to make sense in five or 10 years? Is asset class going to make sense? And what's going on with society? What's changing? What's changing with technology? What's changing with um, aging of population? All these types of things, inflation, everything else. So Today, I have a lot of different considerations that what I've done is I've kind of created what I call a box of targets that I tend to have so I can filter out opportunities immediately. What I mean by that is it has to be, depending on the asset class, it has to be a certain vintage or year, a certain 
asset class type as far as how nice or not nice it is and who it caters to. Um, it has to be, I stay away from certain geographies because those are too expensive. So I don't yield enough cash flow, like Los Angeles, as an example. Um, I look for an experienced operator who has done X number of deals. I look for diversification within the property of tenants to reduce risk further. Uh, and this is for each asset class. And so I've had now all these years to figure out how to handle each of these asset classes. And I can even tell you, for example, that right now I'm mostly on the sidelines because of everything going on right now. I'm just waiting to see what happens. Is there going to be a recession? Are prices going to adjust more? Whatever it's going to be. But I have preferred asset classes for the next 10 years that I think having had all the learnings and what I think is coming up are going to be the highest probability of success for more predictable cash flow for myself for the next 10 years. Right. So it's all that together and more. So I can't wait to get into that. We're definitely going to have to tease that out of you, which which are your preferred asset classes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I definitely uh, I before we get into that, though, yeah. I wanted to I wanted to keep going on that that first deal or the first couple deals that you did and just talk about the the process of of taking that leap of faith first of all saving the money uh putting the cash aside not spending it and then taking the leap of faith and those those few years in the beginning where it's just like a couple hundred dollars a month and it really doesn't feel like you're accomplishing anything so can you first speak to just you know uh, for for just to give you context i mean most of our listener group is uh, our airline pilots who are making you know nowadays 250 to six seven hundred thousand a year plus um and we have very generous retirement plans that the company contributes to whether we contribute or not so there's a, sort of a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow if you spend every dollar you ever make you're still going to have some financial cushion at the end uh, and i'm not a big fan i don't think ryan is either of of relying on the the 401k as your yeah. you know your retirement vehicle um but can you just speak to the process of saving that money, what you were going to do with it before you decided to invest in, in, in it passively, and then just the first few years of that trickle of cash flow, not really feeling like you're, you're getting anywhere? Yeah, I have a good story, actually, about these small check sizes I'll share with you. I don't think I've actually ever yeah. shared them before. It's never come up. But um, so first thing I'll say is that I am a very big fan of diversification to help reduce risk. And so what I actually when I go passive, what I tell people is I trade control for diversification across asset classes, geographies, and operators, okay, That's all three. Amazing. And so, if but if, if I don't actually get diversified across all three, I'm literally increasing my risk in doing so because I'm already giving control to somebody else. I'm already increasing my risk to a certain extent, right? right? So that's how I end up reducing the risk a little bit. And so the problem is that if you can't afford to diversify across a bunch of things over a certain period of time, not up, not up front right away, not immediately, but if you are not going down a path with that mindset and that business plan, then you're you're putting yourself at a higher risk than you need. And by the way, I should tell everybody, I'm not a financial advisor or anything, right? It's just my perspective as an investor. Right. But um, so that's very important. So I would say that if if you're scrounging up, say your first call it 50,000, which is the most common minimum investment right now, and you think you're not gonna have another 50,000 for another four years for argument's sake, I think that this may or may not be the best space for you, or there may be other ways for you to go about it where you can put into smaller chunks and go through an intermediary, like a crowdfunding site, for example, Right. and ended up diversified in a smaller way. But I think that's highly important. So that's number one. Number two is that I guess it depends on the person's goal, but the most common thing I see is people trying to get out of the corporate world over a certain period of time. And what they'll do is they put themselves into a mindset and a budget of, okay, I'm going to save up money to invest in X number of deals per year, whatever it is, and that they're, it's just an equation, right? So over five or 10 years, I'm going to invest in Y number of deals, and then I'm going to get to X, Z amount of cash flow per month. And I think that that's very powerful. And if you can get on that path and really stick to the plan and get on the plan, I think it can make a huge difference by actually having a plan. I think that's really important. Um, but I cannot stress the power of compounding enough if you use a spreadsheet and actually look at numbers. And I, you may have heard this, whoever's listening, you may have heard this um, theoretically before. I would recommend going onto a spreadsheet or even grabbing someone's spreadsheet that already has done it. You would be shocked at the 10 or 20 year impact of compounding. It doesn't have to be 40 years. It could be literally just 10 years or 15 years. And um, and that's what I would say you do if you're worried about getting small checks. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a very quick story, um, which is, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Seinfeld where like Jerry's catching like the 10 cent royalties from like overseas <laughs> or something from some syndication, right? And is like, he's not bothering to cash them. So when I started investing in ATMs in 2008, I started with one. Right. And I was doing individual ATMs, not into a larger fund. 
And I would get a monthly payment. And these were like $5,000 investments. And I, a lot of these would be $80, $40, $120. And back then, I literally had to take these checks to the bank machine. Thankfully, they, they were actually able to deposit a check back then. And each one had to go in separately. And some of the machines would have to do like one check at a time at, what, per transaction. So I'd be at the machine for like 20 minutes putting, you know, 10 or 15 checks in at like 40 bucks a pop, <laughs> right? But if you put on the spreadsheet, what I've made from those ATMs over, you know, it's been 15 plus years of compounding, it is astronomical. So I cannot stress the exercise enough of going onto a spreadsheet, just looking at some compounding, even at a very conservative return level. And I've got I, a, I actually have a spreadsheet that I built personally. Uh, if if you uh, if anybody listening would like it, just reach out to info at turbinecap.com. Brian, you're we'll put it say? we'll put it in the show notes. We we had a we had a, a guy go build an entire thing. It tracks K ones and and all that. Yeah, stuff. I so I I have yours as well. Definitely download yeah. Ryan's. Uh, the one that I built is just to show what will happen if you invest in a hypothetical syndicated deal oh, over and over yeah. and over and over and over. Let's again. share both. It tells you how much money. Let's uh, share both. Up, yeah, let's definitely. Yeah. One thing, Jeremy, that that, I, that you keep saying that I think um, needs a little bit of clarification. You keep saying mm -hmm. giving up control. Yes. And 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 I want to just kind of highlight that a little bit with the listeners. When you invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you can go on a website and click a couple of buttons and get your money back. Um, that to me is the control I think you're talking about. When you well, it's it's that it's so that's liquidity to me. Control is, um, you know, so I, I when I, I I can give anybody 20 ways a deal can go wrong in this what I call one percent risks as soon as I give control to somebody else. And some of it has nothing to do with their actions, but some of it does. There could be fraud, mismanagement, Ponzi scheme risk. I mean, people who actually run Ponzi schemes at some point they actually were legitimate and then they turned right. And so you could do background mm -hmm. checks, you could do all the checks you want, but if you go in at the wrong time, you could be a victim of that. So there's all what I call these one percent risks. And actually, even some of those that are, for example, fire at the property and then your insurance won't pay. Well, how does that person handle that? Right. How do they manage that? Um, and there's a lot. That's a very complicated scenario I just laid out. So I'm not going to get into all that. But the point is that I may have approached it completely differently than the manager. And the manager may have done a better job at managing that or a worse job at managing that. But I'm giving them control. Right. I will push back a little on that and just just for the audience, uh, play devil's advocate here and say that, you know, sometimes giving up control is a good thing if you don't know what you're doing. Right. <laughs> oh, so if, yeah. As yeah. if you are an active real estate investor, you've been in it for 20 years, you know exactly what you're doing. Giving up control is going to be really hard. Right. But if you have never invested in a real estate deal, giving up that control might not be such a bad idea. Right. Well, I, I will say this, though, that the most common time I think that is the most appropriate comparison, because to your point, I would never, I, I've invested in, I don't know how many apartment buildings at this point, okay, or mobile home right. parks or whatever. If you gave me the keys to any of these, I wouldn't have the first clue what to do, right? It would just <laughs> be done. I mean, honestly, right? And I don't really have an interest in learning that either. It just wouldn't interest me. And so 100%, but the most common comparison I see is someone who wants to buy a single family home, let's say, or pool of homes, or, or maybe buy them over time, and they're going to have a pool of homes. And then I say to them, okay, well, you know, you can invest in a fund of single family homes that are cash flowing, or you can buy your own properties. But then you, when you buy your own properties, you have the ability to fire the property manager, refinance the loan, sell the properties anytime you want, et cetera. If you're going into that fund, you're literally being put on a bus. Someone else is driving the bus. You cannot get off the bus until they stay, come on off. You might be able to vote on, I got to stop for a bathroom break. Can you let me off here for five minutes? But the point is that like, you're going along the ride wherever that person's taking you, that driver's taking right. you. And I think that points to incentive alignment. That's the most important thing is to make sure that the bus driver is incentivized by the same things that that you are, right? That is hugely important. Uh, that's obviously a very complicated. There's a lot of ways to, right. to manage that. Um, but yeah, that's a very important thing. And I do look for certain structures and avoid certain structures for that reason. Um, some of it has to do with fairness. Some of it you want to make sure as an investor that the operator is getting compensated fairly to keep them motivated. You want to make sure you're getting a fair shake as well compared to market. There's a lot, there's a lot there as well. Right. A lot to unpack in terms of fees and, and splits and stuff like that. Yeah. But in any case. Yeah. Let, let's talk about the vetting of the, of the person who you're going to give that control to, you know, I know there's a, probably a huge list of things that you go through, but what, what are your top three or four that, you know, what, what are your, um, you know, I, we like to say, we like to get to know fast as we can on a deal. What, what would be kind of your top deal killers to sort of 
definitely don't do don't do a deal with that guy or or yep. what are the things that you do yep for yeah deal killers are easy so um so number one is background check um i i unfortunately i never taken a poll but i would have to guess nine out of ten or more investors don't ever do background checks i have been saved by multiple background checks over the past 20 plus years some of them have been much more obvious than others but still and so if something very odd comes out on background check i mean i remember doing a background check on one guy who i had met who literally appeared to be going from one state to the next, getting sued by 20 to 40 investors at a time, and then he'd just move and then start over and deal with that at the same time, right? That that was kind sounds of obvious. exhausting. Yeah, it sounds exhausting, and it's just what some people do. <laughs> what do you What do you do? I mean, walk a step through. But so, so you go to a website to pull the background check. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah. I use something called TLO, like Tom Larry Organization, which um, is owned by TransUnion, and it's actually difficult to join. It's expensive. I've been using it for over, I've probably been using it since 2004 or something like that. And um, that there's another one that's well-known called Accurant, which is A-C-C-U-R-I-N-T, which is owned by LexisNexis. Those are kind of one of the, those are amongst the top ones. There may be less expensive, easier ones to use online. I'm not familiar with them. You get a tremendous amount of information. You get bankruptcy, liens, judgments, history, property owned, companies involved with, companies owned. Um, and it goes into like tremendous, I mean, you can get down to like, car driver's license voting you know registration pilot's license pilot's licenses 100 yeah. percent. other other um like real estate license other types of licenses um all kinds of stuff um and so so, so but going back to your answer ryan so number one is background checks so something comes up really fish in the background check even if you're not 100 sure not worth the risk just move on to the next one right number two is alignment for sure um i would say at least once a year i see a deal that's so out of whack with what i look for in alignment I just will not only will I not go into that deal, but I don't think I'm ever going to invest with that sponsor because um, I get worried about what's the mindset of that sponsor if they're so out of whack with like they're just trying to get so much on their side of the table that I, I'm almost afraid to like what would I get as an investor investing with them in other ways, right? What's an so, example? Um, God, I've seen um, I've seen stuff for let's put a preferred return aside because some people don't believe in those and that's fine. Like there's different ways to invest, but I've seen stuff where like the investor is getting a tiny fraction above the preferred return where it's just completely out of market. Typically over a 50, 50 split is very uncommon. And, um, it, and I'm sorry, Jeremy, know, can you just explain what a preferred return is for the listeners? Yeah, sure. So preferred return is essentially from the distributable cash flow. Um, most, but not all opportunities have what's called a preferred return, which is the investor gets the first X percent before there's a profit slip between the investor and the sponsor so that the investor is kind of ahead on getting recouping some of that cash flow before the sponsor gets a profit split. Now that does not, that's below the line of management fees. That's below the fine of other expenses and taxes and everything else, but it's the distributable profits that are available. So it aligns investors a little bit with the fact they put up the capital risk. Um, and so that's what the, that's how the preferred return works. And it actually accumulates. If you don't hit it in a year, say your preferred return is 8%, you've gotten five. You're now actually accumulating an additional 3% and it rolls over typically non-compounded into the next year. So now you're getting the eight plus the three to make up for it. So it's, it's right. a downside risk protection for investors as well. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying. And when you yeah, say, yeah. and then the 50, 50 is basically anything that's left over above and beyond that you would want to see at least a 50 50 split or more favorable to you like a 70 30 yes. or an 80 20 or yes. whatever it might be yep yeah anything that goes below 50 50 to me is a big red flag if, if it's an experienced sponsor if it's a new sponsor and they're trying to figure out the territory it's a different story but if it's an experienced sponsor they you have to assume they kind of know what market is at that point and they're you know it's almost like you know you're looking at a auto tray i'm sorry i'm a car guy so you're looking at Auto Trader and you want to buy a Ferrari and everybody's charged, everybody's asking 100,000, but that that exact same car is like 150 somewhere else, right? Right. And that's just someone who's just trying to get more for it. It's no different. And what do you like if you have to be in bed with them, doing business with them and actually have them run something, what is that going to look like from your side of the table as an investor? It's probably not worth finding out. Yeah. Very good. Love that. Uh yeah. So so that's so that's number two for sure, Ryan. Um and then number three would be um, if if the business plan, like so if it conforms to what I'm targeting as far as the um, business, the general profile of the property, how occupied it is, what the general business plan is, but some of the assumptions are completely out of whack as far as being very aggressive, 
that's another thing I will immediately discard. So I'm I am personally looking to invest with someone who is conservative, which matches my personality, is under promising and possibly to over deliver to investors to build long term relationships with investors. And I'm completely trying to avoid someone who's aggressive using very high assumptions in terms of, let's say, revenue increases, has really fancy marketing on top of it all. Doesn't matter if I reinvest with them or not, even if they underperform because they're going to use the marketing machine to find new investors. I'm trying to avoid that. So that's also a very quick, easy filter to determine if that's the wrong fit for me. And just to unpack what Jeremy just said, typically when you look at a real estate deal that uh, you know an operator is is pitching to investors, they're going to put together a nice fancy marketing package that's called the offering memorandum or the executive summary. And that's the, the fancy glitzy uh, with all the projections and things like that. There's also an underwriting file, which is a, an extremely complicated spreadsheet that uh, outlines all of the assumptions, the financial assumptions on the deal. And that you can pop the hood and look in the underwriting model and see whether the sponsor is being either aggressive in their assumptions or conservative in their assumptions uh, when it comes to things like expenses, rent growth. You know, if they if they think that they're going to get a 50% bump on rents in the first year, well, that's pretty pretty unrealistic, right? That would be a very aggressive assumption. That's obviously going to drive much higher projected returns. So you really have to look at what's what's on the back end. Yeah. And I would just add to Tate what Tate said is that um, you have to be very careful because Sponsors can do all kinds of things to make the numbers look better. You right. know, they can they can assume a much higher exit value than what's realistic. They can create a big gap between the revenues and expenses that compounds over the years that actually makes the numbers look much better after 10 years, for example. There's a lot of things that could be done. Right. Right. How did Very you good. learn all that knowledge? How, how how did you learn all that underwriting? How how you know someone's probably thinking like, okay, but how do I, you know, I I'm just getting started. What how do I even learn about underwriting files and what to look for. Yeah. Well, so I'm trying to think I'd answer that because things have really changed since I started, you know, in terms of access, there's now, you can buy books that actually go over this, for example. Um, but when I started, I did it through opportunity exposure and you can still do that today. That's what I call it, which is, you know, let's say you want to learn about apartments. Okay. And you really are starting from scratch. I would personally, assuming you're a credit investor, I'd actually sit in my pajamas, go on to 10 crowdfunding websites, download 10 or 20 apartment deals, literally lay them out all next to each other and look at the similarities and the differences. And once you start to see the differences, you start to learn what to look for. That's really how I started. Um, you have to be comfortable with numbers. You have to be comfortable with Excel in some cases, but at least understanding expense ratios and you know percentage increases and all this. But if you can understand a basic income statement, then you could probably get pretty comfortable with this pretty quickly because they all end up being very similar, right? They're all going to have certain the same expenses or to an extent they're all going to have management fees they're going to have all different types of expenses and but it, running one building to the next is very similar um in the same asset class anyway I love so, that. and i always i always want to encourage people uh for the record to always do their own due diligence but i do have to say that there's a lot of people out there that are mr magoo and you know what? Sometimes that works out. If you find somebody you trust and you can just invest with them over and over again, that that works too. You don't have to become an expert in P and Ls and underwriting and all this stuff. So just just to, you know to to lay that out there for the people that are like, oh my god, I don't know if I can. Yeah, and, and I always say too, like never like I always start small with people, right? right. Like I'm not going to put yes. if, if I have you know a million dollars to invest with somebody i'll start with 50 and then just see how the right. first one sort of goes and never swing at the first pitch you know just just Absolutely. get on as many lists as you can and watch these deals go by and you know you learn a lot from that like I, that was really great i and these crowdfunding websites like you were saying jeremy are, are widely available you can go on you can create a login for free you can download everything and just start reading stuff and like you said you'll start noticing differences between the twos you know the three you know three or four or five different offerings and you're like you know, how is this operator, you know, getting a 50, 50% EGI on this deal and all these other guys are doing 30%, you know, that, that, that might be my red flag or, you know, whatever yeah. it might be. Right. So that's right. And I should clarify, I'm not trying to endorse crowd and funny sites or not. They're the right <laughs> fit for certain people to the wrong fit for other people, but it, they are a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, easy way to get a whole bunch of opportunities into your computer within an hour. Right. Which is normally yeah. very difficult to do. I was actually just going to ask you, you know, when you, when you talk about crowdfunding website, we're talking about uh, online platforms like Fundrise, CrowdStreet, YieldStreet, uh, Cadre, yeah. places like this, right? What, Jeremy, what are your thoughts on on those websites versus investing directly with an operator like Ryan or or in a fund like my like us? Yeah, 
Well, so I think the crowdfunding websites serve a very good purpose for certain people. And I, I want to give everyone a disclaimer. Uh, I, I am technically still an active advisor for Realty Mogul, one of the largest crowdfunding sites. Um, I started with them back in 2012. I haven't really done anything with them probably for five years now, but I'm, I'm not like ended a cut. There's, you know, it was just on a per need. Um, so, uh, but, um, so I think that crowdfunding sites are really great or investor groups are great in that they're both, um, designed to be companies that try to find opportunities for investors and vet them for investors. Now, if you're out there and you're like, look, I, I, I fly too many time zones or, I, my my schedule is too busy. And when I'm off, I need to just decompress. I don't want to deal with finding opportunities. I don't want to deal with networking to try and find opportunities, right? Which is really some people don't like to do at all, right? Let alone spend the time on. Then those types, like a crowdfunding site, could be a good alternative. Um, it ends up being an intermediary, so you have to be aware of the fact that your returns are slightly lower than if you were to invest directly with the sponsor. But there's a trade-off that could actually make sense for you. Now. I am a full-time investor, so I'm not going to invest in an intermediary normally unless there's some unique situation because I have the time and that's what I do is I try to find the stuff directly. But there's plenty of people for whom these are really good fits for because they don't have the time or the interest to go find opportunities themselves. Right. Great. 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 Uh, great perspective on that. So it's, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on the the difference between, can you just sort of outline, I think we we touched on it earlier, but the difference between private securities and uh sorry public securities and private securities so so stocks bonds mutual funds all those things that are in the public market and yes there's volatility but i mean that's sort of the bread and butter of the majority of the population in this country you know most people have not still to this day wandered into the the private market you just outline the differences between those two and and you know pros and cons of each yeah sure um so public markets very liquid you press you know, sell on your fidelity account. You hopefully have your cash in two or three days. So you're going to find a buyer in in, in seconds or milliseconds. Um, private market, almost exact opposite. Uh, you know, very difficult to liquidate, hard to find a buyer. I believe it's actually illegal to flip your shares within the first year per the SEC. Um, and sometimes you'll take a discount to the actual value when you're selling. That's actually very common. Very hard to value that, you know, versus Apple share that's trading every God knows how many times a second we know the actual value at this very moment. Right. Um, I like to say that if you're going to go down this path, the goal is to have, if you're going to trade off liquidity, so you don't have the ability to sell, I would like to hope the returns are going to be higher. There's some other benefits, such as tax benefits and other things that actually compensate for the lower return. And that's the way that I look at it. I think that the, right. the difference is worth it. Um, I do think eventually there may be more liquidity options in the space from a technology perspective on some stuff that might be coming up, say, in the next 10 years, but that's not here today. So and we don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, I think that one thing to note that I think is really important when I talk to older people who are either already retired or are coming up to retirement, and especially if they're going to use a retirement account, for example, to invest with some of this in a self-directed manner, be sure you're taking into account the liquidity because I have seen people come up with challenges before. Um, I know one investor who used their retirement account and they were at the age they so being in a longer term deal, say a 10 year deal, they got to the age where there was forced withdrawals. But the problem was that opportunity had a challenge, stopped cash flowing. They were literally having phantom income because of their retirement forced withdrawals that they have to come in huh. with cash, what they weren't getting in a retirement. So that now you're having forget get making the cash flow. You're actually now having to come out of pocket to pay taxes on something you're not getting cash flow from in your retirement. And, you know, I don't know what their budget was and their whole living situation, but they had to go and actually sell those interests, um, which again, like we talked about before, can be hard and can also be at a loss uh, in that position. So I would advise people who are significantly older to just consider the liquidity piece because um, there's a lot of benefits to that too. Uh, but overall, I love the private space because I think I'm getting outsized returns um, in exchange for the less liquidity. And also, by the way, another thing is that you are not exposed to the whims of the market, uh, the stock market, for example, on, you know, if the stock market crashes, everything crashes, everything to a different degree, but most things will crash down and often without merit, right? You can be in a well-performing real estate deal, right. but the rate that you're in is much lower than it was 10 days ago with nothing different, right? And so you don't get that volatility and exposure as well on the private side, not on a day-to-day -day basis. I love that you mentioned the, the, um, uh, the REIT, right? Because you could be saying, Hey, I'm investing in real estate in my, right. In my 401k, look at this. I got a, I got a publicly traded REIT. Well, it's, it doesn't matter how well it's performing. If the market crashes, yeah, everything's going to be pulled down. Yeah. And also there's, 
also advantages to the REIT because it's liquid, but then you don't get tax benefits and depreciation flow through. Um, you know, you yeah, you're paying you're paying a nice tax rate on dividends for sure. But I'll tell you another thing that isn't normally discussed is that I tend to not invest in what's called class A properties, which is institutional huge properties, because often those have slightly or significantly lower cash flow and they're in primary cities like Los Angeles, New York, Miami, where I tend to stay away from because the cash flow is lower. And that's what you're getting typically when you're investing in a publicly traded REIT, for example. That's what their mandate is. And that's how they're putting all that capital to work. So you right. want to make sure that even if you're looking at the liquid side, that it's actually the right fit for you as far as what you're targeting. I usually call REITs, I jokingly call them death stars because they're like these, I mean, there's the, they're just these massive swaths of, <laughs> you know, going and gobbling up these, these uh, portfolios of real estate that are, that's already stabilized. You know, they're not nimble enough to go in grab strategically grab single assets and and bring them up and create value right yeah Jer jeremy how many times have you invested in these private placements these private securities we've been talking about yeah so um i i don't know the exact number but it's been over 20 years i've been in over 150 to 200 plus which is like very extreme wow. I, I don't recommend that it's kind of <laughs> hyper diversified and it happens when you're doing it full time um like I, right now I'm in over 60 LLCs. So I have dealing with all these K1s, which is one of the challenges, the tax time. Um, but it's been a long time now. So, yeah. What, what, what's your favorite, what was your favorite one? Well, um, and you don't that, have to go into details if you can't, and that's totally fine. Yeah, but you, you can I, I have my, favorite. the favorite one that comes to mind from a cash flow perspective is probably the ATM machine just because of the way they performed since 2008. Um, I had two different operators I've invested with, one of whom wound down their operations out 15 years last year. That one I probably averaged over 15 years, roughly um, about a 30% cash on cash return per year, which on a comp, if you put on a spreadsheet compounding, it's ridiculous, right? Wow. Um, wow. And then um, I'm with a bigger one now who's slightly lower, but really great and uh, you know predictable cash flow. That's my favorite long-term, um, pro probably my favorite. Also had monthly distributions instead of quarterly, all kinds of you know tax uh very very um favorable from a tax perspective the favorite i'd say that my most lucrative investment though i i'm you know i do like one percent startups 99 percent cash flow and startups are only when i have to make a bet on somebody i'm not looking for startup but someone i know well and i've had the highest by far multiple in a couple of startups compared to the other more predictable stabilized cash flow stuff interesting great yeah well should, we, we, we should have a, a show about startups and Definitely. Series A investing and, and things like yeah. that is like the whole and other we've space. Been, yeah. And we've been looking at running an ATM fund for a long time. Mm. That's probably coming this year. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Jeremy, you, you mentioned taxes a couple of times, and this is something that's uh, a little bit of a gray area for, for pilots that haven't um, experienced the benefits of real estate, tax depreciation, and, and, and other asset classes. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you can offset income using these deals, uh, how most people cannot offset active income, but sort of how you were able to throw, continually throw money over the fence onto the passive side. And now I'm sure most of your income is, is uh, tax-free, right? Yeah. Well, uh, so I want to clarify that. So the yeah, first thing is well, sure. I'm not an accountant, of course. So of know, course. Just my understanding as an investor. Second is, um, I always don't, I don't like using tax-free because really in the end of the day, when you're using depreciation to offset income, it's actually deferred Deferral, because there is a recapture right. assuming you sell something at a value in, in the future, right? So, right. Um, and by the way, no, I, I don't end up perfectly tax deferred every year. I, I, I pay taxes, but just a much smaller rate than a normal person would pay, right? Because I, I don't, I also don't force uh, investing and especially the last few years when it was really tough to invest in terms of end of cycle and me being conservative. I don't force investments to get the tax benefits in a year. Some people do, and they find these other strategies and stuff. I don't do that. Um, but um, so the so to Tate's point, um, when you're investing passively, you typically cannot offset it against active income. And active income is like when you're a pilot and you're on a salary, that's your active income. You're actually actively doing that, right? Um, now, we're not going to get into detail today, I'm sure, but there's ways you could potentially offset some of that or there's there's strategies but we'll have another so, show on that but yeah, yeah that's, that's another not, episode we have, we have a tax attorney coming on another show that's going to go into that yeah okay and it's not as straightforward as i'm making it sound it's not like you know some loophole and it's that simple but it's legal or whatever it's actually you have to either anyway there's there's a lot of things you can do but it takes work it's not so simple um right. If someone in my position who's passive on pretty much everything, I get the advantage of actually offsetting most or all of my income 
uh, like we talked about on the depreciation side. Um, and um, but it's very important to keep in mind again. I don't want people to like think, oh, you're never going to pay tax. It's just not true. You pay recapture. They recapture the depreciation that you took that you shouldn't have taken once something sells, and they say the actual value of the asset in the end. So I think that's a very important point. At the same time, I hate to say it, but reality is whoever created the tax um, laws for real estate and these types of investments are obviously incentivizing these types of investments. We end up paying much lower tax rate than an average employee, especially someone like a pilot at a high salary level. Um, in fact, if you knew our tax rates or my tax rate compared to the work you do and the tax rate you pay, you'd probably be pretty upset. And I don't mean in a bad way, just <laughs> it's not really fair, right? It's just that's just the way it is. But yep. you can't really fight the system. So you may want to take advantage of the system. Everything's legal and it's just the way the laws are set up. So, yep. well, no. Yep. And if you're listening to this show, you're taking the first step in learning how to reduce your taxable income. And um, that's how we're providing this to our listeners. So, no yeah, need to be I apologetic. I want to stress it, like, because I remember at the beginning, like, as an employee, I had no clue about reducing taxes, right? There's a, there's a W-2, they take taxes, you're paying whatever, you know, just a generally like, you know, H&R block type of thought process. And mm -hmm. um, it is amazing when you learn about the types of tax laws that are created to benefit investment into companies, into real estate, into property, um, what's out there. And it's just, yeah, do take the time to learn about it because it's it's pretty amazing how much can be saved. That's amazing. That's great. Well, Jeremy, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, thank you so much for all the value that you've you've brought to the show today. Can we just close out with, you know, for for someone who's making, you know, half a million dollars a year or nearly that, um, it's a lot of income to replace. Can you just speak to sort of, you know, the the chipping away at it, what it felt like when you when you realized that you had enough passive income to leave your job and just some words of wisdom for for someone who may have not realized before that, that was even possible. Yeah. Well, let me let me just go through real quick what I did at the beginning because the beginning is the hardest part. And not only are you trying to test in small pieces, you may not have the capital to really put a lot of money to work. Um, I did a combination of what I call amortized and non-amortized opportunities. So I, I don't want to make this more complicated than it needs to be. But just like when you get a home loan, right? When you're paying off uh, the monthly payment, you're actually usually paying off a combination of principal and interest. So meaning at the end, you have no payment left. Your last payment, you're not paying a big amount of money at the end to get the house. It's like you've made it through all the payments, right? right. Whereas in some cases, like a real estate investment, um, you're typically getting some big amount, hopefully at the end when you sell the property, there's a lot of value to unlock there. So right. I did a combination of, of kind of opportunities that were like real estate and or were real estate that actually had big payouts at the end, along with stuff that had bigger payouts ongoing as if you know, almost like I gave you that home loan and I was getting all that money back and I was getting bigger payments of principal and interest combined each month. And I was able yeah. to kind of what I call accelerate or supercharge my cash flow by combining the two. And actually take the ATM is a really good example of that and that cash on yeah. cash number that I mentioned, right? And so that's something to consider for someone who's starting new. It's not as easy to find um, the ones where they're combining principal and interest back and the cash flows are higher, but I did a lot of that. What's dangerous about doing that is if you want to then leave the corporate world and live off that cash flow, you're eating into the actual principle you're getting back if you're if you're living right. off of all of it. It's not a good idea. So what I had to do is rotate my money out of more heavily. I was more heavily into these uh, fully amortized opportunities when I was building up the cash flow snowball. But then when I left between 07 and 12, I really did a very specific shift to get less heavily weighted into those types of opportunities. So I wasn't eating into my principal while living off of it. And another important thing to mention is that on a similar note, I would strongly recommend if you are gonna end up uh, leaving the corporate world in the end, don't look for a one-to-one -one ratio of like my living expenses to you know cost of, to, to what I'm earning. Um, I, I, I looked at a two for one ratio, that's when I left. And in case some things don't perform or whatever it is, and I am most comfortable at over a three to one ratio as I went through my process. I could tell you that that's where my real huge comfort level was. If I'm three to one, some stuff goes bad. We have a financial crisis like we just saw and some of it isn't performing. You're still in a perfect condition. Typically, you're not going to lose two thirds of your cash flow if you're really well diversified. So those are some things to consider. I love yeah, it. And I'll, just, and, I'll just, and I'll just conclude by saying, you know, if you're a pilot listening to this and you're probably like, I don't want to quit my job. I want to I want to be in. Yeah, I was pilot. going to say most of us yeah. like our jobs. We could <laughs> yeah. fly less. Right. Yeah. So, so this then is allowing either, us. 
Yeah. Yeah. You, then you you're looking drop more trips and be more flexible. You know, and yeah, totally. There's a lot of reasons to be going on this path. In that case, you're either looking for more predictable cash flow, like I was, you're looking for more outsized returns and more predictable returns compared to stocks and bonds. There's a lot of good reasons to be doing it, even for that reason, for sure. Yeah. Amazing. This was Jeremy. very valuable. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for coming on. And uh, how can listeners get in touch with you? Sure. Yeah. Anyone's welcome to reach out to me if there's any way I can help. Uh, my email is the best way, which is uh, jroll, J R O L L at Roll Investments, R O L L Investments with an S dot com. So jroll at rollinvestments.com. If you're brand new um, or you're experienced, you want to network. If you're new, you have questions. If there's any way I can help, happy to, you know, happy to help. Jeremy, you've always been so generous with your time. And anybody who's in real estate knows this guy. If you're in aviation, you may not, but uh, Jeremy's a pretty big deal. <laughs> And uh, so for him to be giving him, giving out your email address like that is, uh, is no small thing. So Jeremy, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. no problem. Take care. See you soon. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome.